Hey folks, episode 198. I can't believe we're closing in on 200 episodes. Absolutely astounded I've managed this much. <laughs> keeping it going, keeping it going for nearly 200 episodes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is hard work. I'm sure it looks like a lot of fun when I'm discussing things with people on the podcast and it is a lot of fun almost all of the time. Um, but uh, there's a lot that goes into it behind the scenes, uh, for sure. A lot of, a lot of time and multiple. So, you know, if you imagine every hour I spend on the podcast that you see or listen to discussing with people, there are multiples of that hour behind the scenes, um, preparing, reviewing, uh, all the admin, basically all of the admin that goes in alongside running anything really, you know, you know the score, everyone runs something in their lives, be that running children, <laughs> be that running businesses, being running your own daily lives, that's where we are, uh, it couldn't be done, it could not be done without you, the supporters, you the listeners, you the viewers, absolutely couldn't be done, uh, I would not be um, doing it now if there was no one listening or watching and, and, and uh, giving the feedback they do, I value it a great deal and, uh, and, and a special shout as well to the patrons of the podcast who go that extra mile to uh, demonstrate support to me and to HR through their patronage um, voluntary subscription on a monthly basis uh, they get some perks for that they definitely get some perks for it but they don't have to do it and so thank you to the patrons the HR patrons and finally, thank you to the, the sponsors of the podcast. And the two main sponsors with the podcast at the moment are Rugby for Heroes and the Aardvark Group. And you must know them well by now because they have been with the podcast since almost the very start. Almost the very start. Uh, Rugby for Heroes and, and the Aardvark Group. You guys, you two organisations and the two people behind those organisations, Michael Valance and David St. John Clare, you know I appreciate you and I love you very much. Thank you very much for your support. Um, right, 198 is going to be an AMA and ask me anything. So I fired out, uh, I fired this out to this info out to my patrons on the Discord channel, on the Discord server for patrons, and I find it out on Twitter, and I find it out on Instagram inviting questions. And so, we've got a few questions in for me to answer. I have seen these ones already, because I've looked and saw, oh, there's questions coming in, and I have, but I haven't given them any depth of thought, deliberately not, I'm going to answer them on the fly as we go. <coughs> So first question uh, came in via Twitter. This is from Murney. Murney asks, Has any of, have any of my guests and their stories changed anything about how I live my life? The answer to that question is yes. Many, many, many guests have changed uh, how I live my life in, in a small amount of ways. It's, in fact, the whole podcast has every single guest has an impact on me. Every single guest has an impact on me for sure and the influence the way I do or think about things for different reasons. However, there are, there are some that, that, that uh, spring to mind and the, the main one that pops into my mind about how I live my life has got to be, or, yeah, how I live my life has got to be, um, the main recent one has got to be Dr. Jeff Foster, the podcast with Dr. Jeff Foster. Dr. Jeff, uh, he, I invited him on the podcast after my, uh, my girlfriend actually uh, alerted me to him, knows him. Uh, through uh, through work, and uh, it actually turns out he's, he's connected with the local rugby club that I'm also connected with, and my missus is also connected with. But Dr. Jeff wrote a book uh, called Man Alive, and the book is it's basically based on the common issues, common health issues that men face or men are likely to encounter during their lives. And each chapter, each section of the book is one of these health issues. So you don't you don't have to read the book, you know, page one to page two. If you've got a specific health concern, you can go to a section of the book, or you can do what I did. I did have a specific health concern. I, I read through the book. My God, what a superb piece of reading for anyone anyone who has anything to do with a man maybe you are a man or you have got a man in your life a significant man in your life and you want to understand him a bit better or you want to understand yourself a bit better i'm telling you read man alive um one it opened my eyes to uh some of the some of the like really common illnesses and things i could i could encounter during my life and, and other men around me are going to during their life that really common i didn't really understand or know about and uh and 
inform me about those things to it probably alleviate some stress or anxiety that I might get if I if I unfortunately contract one of these illnesses contract sounds like an STD but get one of these illnesses like a prime example of one was uh, prostate cancer before I read Man Alive I didn't have any clue about prostate cancer I just knew it was a cancer and I knew people got it right obviously men get it what I didn't know is one in two men 50% of men will develop prostate cancer in their lives that's a fucking crazy statistic 50% is a batshit crazy statistic, I'm sure you'll agree, right? But in reading the chapter, it alleviated my, uh, any, any anxiety or fears I had about it. And then I started reading the chapter and read that fact. I thought, oh my God, I am probably, or oh, I'm 50% likely to get this. But great chapter. There's a chapter on there about testosterone deficiency. Again, something I'm not really aware, I wasn't really aware of. Now I'm really aware of it, testosterone deficiency. And the importance of testosterone uh, is all sorts of stuff. So to answer the question, Yes, probably the one that is most obvious to me is Jeff Foster, uh, the Jeff Foster podcast. I read the book before he came on, and then I got to talk about the things more in depth on the podcast with him. And it was also quite an entertaining episode. Spoiler alert, there may or, not, may or may not be some personal personal stories of woe on there to do with various things. Various things, <laughs> definite. But I recommend, I, re- I strongly recommend blokes listen to that podcast, follow Dr. Jeff on Twitter, um, and buy his book, Man of Life, for sure. Right, let's bring up some more questions. Bear with me while I navigate to Instagram to dig these out. I'll do these AMAs occasionally in the future. Sometimes I feel like doing them. Sometimes I get questions pinged at me and I think, oh, let's do another AMA. And sometimes it might be that I've had a, a few guests postponed and I end up with a gap in the schedule for recording. I think, oh, let's, let's, drop, a, let's drop an AMA in there. It helps me plug a gap, basically. Um, so let's see. I have to go there. Oh, I can't leave. Right. These are the, these are the questions posted on, on Instagram. Uh, yeah, there was five. Oh, five good ones. Okay. So one of them. It wasn't a question. It was more about airsofters. And the query was literally airsofters. Discuss. I don't really want to discuss airsofters. I think uh, we discussed it at length or at length enough uh, when I had... um, Oh, no. I've forgotten his name. Oh, shit. He's going to kill me. EOD operator. Oh, no. Threat Reduction Limited. Oh, my God. I am having a brain fart. Uh, He's only just come on as well. It's how bad my memory is now. One second. Not... Shit. Hopefully he doesn't listen to this and think, I can't believe you've got my name. Even though we've been in comms several times since he came on the podcast. Who am I talking about? I am talking about... Um, oh, it's Kim, isn't it? Uh, Kim Hughes. For God's sake, you stupid idiot. Kim Hughes. So Kim Hughes came on, we talked about airsofters at length. He kicked out of that conversation based on an experience he'd had. Nothing against airsofters. I don't have anything against airsofters. I genuinely don't. However, they do make for good banter. There's my discussion about them. Refer to the Kim Hughes podcast for amusing discussion about airsofters. Okay, next question. Oh, uh, I what's wrong with Aunt Middleton is the question there. I don't know what the insinuation is there about what's wrong with Aunt Middleton. I don't know. Maybe the person who posted has got his own opinions about Aunt Middleton uh, moving swiftly on. What advice would you would you now give to yourself as you are transitioning out of the military? What advice would you give to yourself now as you are transitioning out of the military? Hmm. The advice would be don't worry about trying to find the the right career, the right industry, the right job to be in immediately. Uh, and also, it would be you don't know how many industries and sectors and jobs there are that suit you yet. Take time, get any job, get any job that meets your financial requirements, your requirements, not your desirables, your requirements, get any job, meets your financial requirements at minimum, get into that job and use that time as a soak period, in military speak, a nice soak period to earn money, adjust to Civvy Street, adjust to the transition out, and you will be gaining valuable information about Civvy, how Civvy Street works, how the commercial world works, and, uh, and it will influence what you think about what you want to do for your career. 
I mean, a prime example, like my day job, I have a day job, believe it or not. I don't do the podcast like full time. I do have a day job, which takes up most of my, well, it takes up all of my working hours, my nine till five and more most of the time. Uh, but my day job, I'm a project manager, which I kind of had that on my radar in the back of my head as an option when I left, just to go, mm, yeah, I could do that. I didn't really know what the fuck it was, um, apart from project managing, but that is, that doesn't, isn't very, very descriptive, believe it or not, about what the actual job entails, depending on where you're doing it. Um, I'm a project manager for a satellite communications company. That's what I do. I was not a signaler when I was in. I had nothing to do with SIGs. I didn't want anything to do with comms when I was in, apart from have them, be able to use them, and, uh, and not end up in a black spot when I needed comms badly. Uh, that was the extent of my comms. My comms on, oh, I could replace batteries. I could tune a frequency. <laughs> that was it. Uh, and now I'm a project manager for a satellite communications company. Um, and I'm a project manager for a satellite communications company and I, in an IT role. So I project manage IT projects now. Like, again, never would have saw myself doing this. And the only reason I know that I'm, I, well, I didn't even go looking for this. I, I've ended up in this role through becoming aware of opportunities and thinking, oh, I can actually do these things. And just, this is where it's, this is where life has navigated me to. Like, in, since I've, since I've left the military, I've been, you know, doing, I've done private security, like a lot of people, private security in the Middle East. I've done private security here in the UK. The, the cool stuff, the inverted commas bodyguard stuff, the PPO stuff, looking after wealthy or well-known people and the shit stuff, stagging on. Um, and I've done like health and safety management. I've done that at, at you know, really significant, significant high level positions and really low level positions, health and safety roles. I've done uh, facilities management. I've done um, project coordination, if you want to call that. That wasn't in that role, it wasn't really project coordination. In this particular role, it was more um, firefighting, fixing issues that the companies had that I was working for and that they couldn't fix themselves. I do, but basically, getting stuff done basically organizing and getting stuff done uh what else have i done my god i've done business to business sales marketing sales basically didn't enjoy that done loads of stuff loads and loads of stuff and where i am now i really really enjoy it really challenging project manager satcoms company doing it stuff never would have thought it i only like i only came to know about this opportunity through networking and basically be exposed to the city world. When I was working in private security in the Middle East, I did that for four years. Man, you don't get much experience of what what um, what the job market looks like in the UK and what your opportunities are for you at all. Um, I try to alleviate that problem by when I was rotating back, when I come back to the UK for a few weeks at a time, um, I would try and do at least one job for any job, for any company when I was back mainly to network and and yeah, well it was mainly to network yeah but it exposed me to again opportunities here in the UK, in the UK whereas other people don't don't maybe make that effort for whatever reason who who the fuck wants to if you've been away for eight weeks or 12 weeks and you're coming back you've only got four weeks off three weeks off to spend with your family who wants to go working you want to spend all that time chilling out with your family um but the, you have to, to to try and make an easy transition back and get a decent job in, in the uk you need to you need to keep your hand in you can't be away and not networking you know if, if all you do is and all your networking is private security in the middle in the middle east or wherever abroad then uh, you're, it is not benefiting any aspirations. You have to go work in the UK. Fact, it is absolutely not. So uh, that's my advice. Uh, next question. How do you take your black coffee? <laughs> I take my black coffee blacker than an Ethiopian coal miner. And I take my tea whiter than a, uh, uh, an Alaskan, an Alaskan, an Alaskan man uh living on in the arctic circle who's got uh a scottish father and irish mother yes very black coffee and very white tea so i have it yeah did i answer that question um dream guests who are my dream guests military police entertainment no military politics entertainment and sport right dream guest military Oh, that's easy. Uh, that's Christine Craighead. Yeah, that's Christine Craighead, for sure. Um, I am of the firm belief that that will happen one day. Uh, uh, yes, I'm of the firm belief that will happen one day. And um, 
we shall see. So Christian Craig Head for sure. Uh, he's a fascinating individual. A lot of respect for him. I didn't know him when he was serving or when I was serving, but I've I've had the good fortune to um, uh, spend some decent time with him, chat with him, just me and him, and uh, yeah, good, a fucking good guy, a fucking good guy. Uh, obviously, given uh, given his experience and what he's known for, but um, I'd love to I'd love to get him on the podcast and chat to him. And I think I think he might be up for it as well, but uh, he's got lots going on in uh, in his world, so um, it may never happen, but we we will see. Politics. So politics. Who would be my dream guest? Political dream guest. Ooh. Dominic Cummins. One. Oh, I don't know how to say this or not. Donald Trump. Two. Vladimir Putin, three. And uh, I say dream guest, obviously in the right circumstances. <laughs> These are people that are enigmas for positive or negative reasons, for the right or wrong reasons. And um, they would be a dream guest. They would be dream guests if I could get them on, and it was and there was no careful editing of not careful. There was no stipulation of oh reviewing reviewing the podcast after we have to edit it and authorize it, release it. It would be done like any other guest comes on. We record, I release. That's it. There's no editing of podcast. When I do these, there's no editing of podcast. What you see is what you get. Literally, what you see is what you get. Sometimes I'll bleep or silence a DL out if it compromises someone or something or an operation or whatever. But there's no edit in a podcast at all. Uh, so, yeah, Cummings, I mean, fascinating individual. Gaz Walsh introduced me to uh, Dom Cummings' Substack. And uh, my God, that man has got a fucking brain the size of a planet. Uh, regardless of what you think about his, like his political motive, motivations, his articles give an incredible, a, an incredible insight and a very unique insight into lots of the significant political events and uh, events, yeah, and like uh, campaigns that have gone on over the last fifteen years. Maybe um, he he's not he has no allegiance anywhere. He has an allegiance to the Brexit campaign, obviously, but he has no allegiance to the politicians he's worked for. He literally doesn't. In his articles, he has, he's got no problem with slinging someone under a bus or saying absolutely what he thinks of them, which is really surprising because he'll end up with a job back in politics at some point. And he's like, if you read his stuff, he could well be burning bridges, but he doesn't care. He, he tells it like it is. That's how I read it anyway. I like it because it's a unique insight into the back end and it's raw. Like, it's, I don't think it's... Uh, you, you get, you know, you, you get an understanding of what the processes are in terms of setting up some kind of political campaign, the way politics influence, uh, the way politicians influence the civil servants and vice versa, the way money plays a part, the way like uh, 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 foreign nations play a part, the way like, uh, you know, companies and profit making plays a part. It's interesting. If It's depressing at times, but it is interesting. Like there's loads, of the, especially the COVID stuff. He is. He, the, if you want to get an insight into how certain decisions are made and why certain decisions are made throughout the COVID campaign, uh, the COVID campaign, the COVID pandemic, um, and why they were made by government, um, um, maybe why things went wrong and why things went right, get out of Dom coming Substack. Highly recommend it. People are going to hate me for that, uh, for for saying it. But uh, I was neutral. I didn't even really have, have a give a damn who he was or what he did i just heard the name in the news really up until i started reading this stuff I was like holy shit yeah and it's not uh his, his articles aren't things that are trying to persuade you to think one way or the other his articles are just what he recalls things being why he understands things to be the way they are and he also doesn't just talk about politics talks about all sorts of things anyway that's that my political uh political guests yes entertainment Okay, entertainment guest. I know he's straight off, straight off, straight off my hand, straight off my hand. I know he's off by heart. Uh, 
Ellie Rosell, I think that's how you pronounce her surname. Ellie Rosell, Rosell, Rosell. She is the lead singer of Wolf Alice. Would love to get her on the podcast. And uh, the other guy is Toby. Oh, the guy who plays rock and roller. The guy who plays, oh, the guy who's in rock and roller, and he's the he's the uh, disabled, the mentally disabled brother in uh, Donnie Darko. Toby, Toby Cabell or Cabell, Toby, Toby Cabell and Ellie Rosal. I'd love to have those two on the podcast, not together, separately. But uh, Toby, I'm going to say Cabell, Toby Cabell, because he's another enigma. He's like he's pretty dark, as in he's off grid on social media. He's not on there. I'm not that I've seen anyway. He's not on Twitter. He's on Instagram. He's not on anything. Um, he's one incredible actor, and um, and because he keeps himself to himself and does these amazing roles, or um, or plays these roles amazingly well, like iconic. He makes them iconic in the way he plays the roles. You know, you, I can't imagine Dead Man's Shoes being Dead Man's Shoes if someone else played. The younger brother. I can't imagine rock and roller being rock and roller if someone else played his his character in it. It'd just be it would just be different beasts. Uh, and then Ellie Rosal because uh, I love Wolf Alice music, but the lyrics of her songs I, I find fascinating. I, I I find like an insight into her mind and the kind of where she goes deep into things. Think what aspects of her of her mind and what aspects of her life and her experiences have formed who she is and what she writes about. And uh, again, another bit of an enigma to, to me, I think she's an interesting one. Like it didn't really, looks like she didn't, she wasn't at the limelight when she started. You know, she was a fucking, not a lot of band members are, are they? They start off because they may want to make music. They're artists and, and, and they hope their music gets big and their music gets, gets, gets brings a, uh, brings good fortune and riches and um i think that was primarily her in but uh, anyway another enigma so yes those two right uh right sport sport dream guests hmm. uh nigel owens nigel see they're going to be rugby oriented probably yeah nigel owens and there's a good possibility i can get him on very good possibility fingers crossed uh nigel owens i would like to interview i i would like to interview alan Wynne jones again uh uh welsh welsh rugby legend alan Wynne jones nigel owens um uh from the mma world probably right now dream guest leon edwards uh who else? Oh, I'll tell you who else on the entertainment side. Woody Harrelson. Yeah. Possibly Matthew McConaughey. Uh, back to sport. Back to sport. Ayrton Senna. If Ayrton Senna was alive. Ayrton Senna. My God. Yeah. Um, but he's not alive. And that wasn't the question. Um, yeah, they're enemy people. I think possibly Lewis Hamilton. And... I'm obviously I'm an F1 fan if you haven't realised already. And Lewis Hampton because I don't know whether to dislike him or not. I've always liked him, always liked his driving, I'm always amazed. Like he's an incredible driver, he's an amazing, you know, ambassador for British British sports people and British people in general. And uh, and and but also he's a bit of a conundrum, isn't he? I can't tell if he really is Mr. Nice, like a nice guy. Who really is a nice guy or or is not. I hope he's a nice guy. I'd like to interview him and get out, get and get and get my own feeling for it, you know. Um, yeah. Who else? Holly Holm, maybe. Ronda Rousey. Ronda would be a good one. Ronda would be a great one, actually. Ronda would be a great one. Um, so Ronda Rousey and Holly Holm, UFC uh, legends. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think those, that's where we are with those, yeah, excellent, okay, have we got any other questions here, have we got any other questions, don't think so, not on Instagram, not on Twitter, I'm just going to check the Discord server, so if you're not aware, there's a, the Discord is like a, it's a, it's a, what do you call it, it's an, uh, a platform for it's like a, not social media it's a chat platform basically um 
uh, yeah, so there's a HR server. You call them servers, so like a, it's like a group, and there's a HR server. And in the HR server, it's, it's all people who want to get involved because they're connected with HR, and the patrons are in there, and there's, there's shitloads of people in there. And it's all different. It's literally active every day, talking away in there. It's really good. Um, bah, 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 bah. So I'm just looking in the server now to see if anyone put anything in the chat. I don't think they did. I think they put them all on Instagram. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, correct. I think we're done. I think we are done. No, Hugh. No, you're not done. Uh, for the eagle-eyed viewers watching this on YouTube, you will notice that as I was checking to see if we were done or not, I've been miraculously now in a different baseball cap and different t-shirt. It's because I thought we were done, and then I actually stopped recording. This is several days ago, and then realized I wasn't done because I got prompted by uh, someone who submitted a bunch of questions to me that I missed because I went to a different part of in Instagram inbox, basically. Uh, so I've come back in the studio to record those questions. They were excellent questions. I don't want to miss them. Uh, and here, <coughs> excuse me. Here we are. All right, so last few questions coming in from Bill. Uh, what was your mentally hardest experience in the military? Mentally hardest experience in the military? Uh, probably, uh, probably, this is going to sound weird, and probably training, probably training, yeah, um, because... All of the things I experienced when I was serving, so you could, so, you know, the way I had my, if you want to call it, like nearest to death experiences, they were while I was actually in, you know, in my unit in three para. Um, you would think that those would be the hardest things to deal with mentally. But to be honest, by the points I experienced those things over the, on the different operations I experienced them, my mental resilience was where it needed to be. Um, and my training and my knowledge and my experiences where it needed to be to be able to cope with those situations so that I didn't find them hard mentally at the time. Uh, so I'd say training was mentally the hard experience and I did find it incredibly difficult. I did generally. So some people find training easier than others or less hard than others. I found, I found it horrendous. I, I did not enjoy it any of it i don't remember enjoying any of it uh, it was uh it was a pretty horrendous yeah a pretty horrendous experience for me and um it's quite violent as well uh again which which fluctuates on on people's experience of depot what what power edge call training depot power depot um in that some people have instructors who are less likely to use their fists or violence to uh correct an incorrect action or as part of their in, you know, instructional methodology. Uh, and others, others are. And I had a few that were like that, um, which I didn't enjoy. When who enjoys getting hit, right? So, um, especially when you can't hit back or you're not supposed to. So training was the hardest experience by far. Not easy. It's not easy. Um, and particularly with power edge training, uh, I know everyone's very proud of their units, as they, as rightly they should be, but... With power edge training, all of our instructors all the way through are, are themselves parachute regiment. So they, uh, they, whereas, whereas that's not necessarily the case with most other, if not all other units, but other units, uh, their, their instructors may not, in training, may not be of the same cap badge, which is just the way it works. With power edge, they are, so they tend to be a bit more emotionally invested in whether they're a recruit, rec you know, private Kia, the recruit in phase one or phase two is uh, is doing what he should be or not. Um, oh, yeah, I found it not nice at all. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you look down on those who quit in depot or failed P company? And do most power edge guys share your view answer to that is no and i tested myself there thinking about that in that i thought about people who quit in depot and people who fail p company who i you know i can remember them or i'm still in touch with some of them uh, am i still in touch with some of them? yeah i'm still in touch with some of them um and i didn't think of them in a negative light you know, certainly not in a way of looking down on them. No, I think in, maybe I did. Maybe I did in the past. I certainly probably did that uh, when I was serving, for sure. 
I'd be very surprised if it didn't when I was serving. But perceptions change, right? And understanding of things changes. And I definitely look down on um, people who are not part of Reg, which is kind of the same thing. Failed at quitting, quitting power depot or failed P company. Um, but now, no, I don't look down on them. Uh, there's different reasons people achieve different things or or fail different things, and it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean that they uh, don't have a value in in uh, in life or in the world. So, no is the answer to that question. The second part of the question was: Do most of the power edge share your view? I'm going to say no because you said most of the power edge. So I'm going to assume you mean serving. I'm going to say no. Most most definitely, most power edge will look down on people in some way, shape, or form who quit who quit in depot or fail P company. And that's just uh, and that's just down to the the regimental spirit, ethos, camaraderie, everything behind everything behind the unit, you know, um, everything that makes up the unit or any unit's cohesiveness and um, and will to succeed and ability. So Okay, next question from Bill. When did you have the most fun in the military? During my career, I actually didn't get a lot of opportunities to go on the fun trips um, for various reasons. So when I when I was in when I was in um, the operational tempo was really really high, and such was my just the way my career progressed. I ended up I ended up missing most of the jollies if not all of the jollies like there was trips to america trips to poland most they were mostly it was mostly training stuff you know train exercises italy uh like i said america goodness me loads of places um but it was something different right and it was there was definitely a lot of fun had by the by the guys who went out on those trips uh my my the most fun i had probably was so in 2009, we went jungle training in Uganda, and that was definitely fun. The jungle training was super hard, um, but great, great way, great way to uh, bring on a unit's uh, soldiering skills for sure. Like just take them up another notch. Um, I think I think every every single unit should go to the jungle at some point in their in their uh, in their training regimes. Um, but Uganda was the most fun, and it wasn't in the jungle. Uh, all the parts of that were good. Some of the shooting range was really good, but it was uh, it was the downtime. So the rare opportunities we had for downtime. We came out of the jungle after about I don't know, maybe it was two weeks, or maybe it was ten days, two weeks, and we had a a day off, I think, or two days off, and that happened to coincide with my birthday, and myself and two others. So when we came out of the jungle, we were staying a few hours away from like, we, when we were in the jungle to get back to the camp, if you like, like the the, sort of the the base location where we first stayed when we first got into Uganda, it was a Ugandan army camp. And it was on the outskirts of a town called Jinja, J-I-N-J-A in Uganda. And on our couple of days off in the middle of that jungle training, we came out, it was on my birthday, and in Jinja, there was a horseback safari place called Nile Horseback Safaris. I knew it was there because I'd done a quick, I'd done a map recce. I'd done a recce online before we left to go to Uganda because I'd not long started horse riding and I wanted to, I thought, oh, if I go out there and we get any downtime, it'd be amazing if I could go and just go and ride a horse in Africa. <laughs> you know, it was as basic as that. And a couple of days we had off coincided with my birthday. And so I spent my birthday with two really close mates. So Jared, who actually started his podcast for me, and Kiwi. And the three of us went, uh, we went horse riding uh, around Ginger, which was on the Nile. You know, couldn't think of anything better. Spending a, spending a few hours on horseback, uh, riding down the banks of the Nile, and then finishing up that evening with, with beers and getting getting very, very drunk. And very, very merry in uh, in Ginger before we went back into the jungle. So that was definitely the most fun. Yeah. The next question. Do I like the person I've become? What do I wish I could change about my character, if if there is anything? Uh, there's caveats it with. Not a dig, by the way. I seem like a decent bloke. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, is there anything I like to change about my character? 
Yeah, I think um, I th- I think over time over time I th- I'm actively working on this. I think that I do have the tendency to either come across to people very arrogant in certain circumstances, or I'm actually being arrogant in certain circumstances, <laughs> and I'm not sure. Well, maybe maybe it's just because I I think I'm one of those I'm one of those individuals that definitely in the past has assumed what I think is right all of the time. <clears throat> Mainly opinion based, right? And you think what, and I think everyone thinks what they think is right, but without with with it being baseless. Uh, and so I try and work on that now all the time, and also assuming that someone's someone's contradiction to your point of view um, is invalid because it contradicts your point of view. And I try and actively work, and those kind of things play into arrogance, right? And I, I definitely try and actively work on that. One, uh, you know, minimizing being arrogant, and two, minimizing the appearance of being arrogant because they're different things, but they can appear the same. Um, and the main way I do that is just by it's just by not assuming that I'm one hundred percent right all the time, and it, it it's by opening my mind to to accepting or being more yeah being more open to listening to and not having a negative response to an opposing opinion to, opinion to your own because no one's right all the time, and there are definitely opinions and and beliefs I've harbored. Uh, or in my life, which have turned out to be wrong, and that is a bitter, swill, p- bitter pill to swallow. But it happens all the time, and it's going to happen throughout my life. Because I'm not always going to be right. Uh, so uh, yeah, I try and minimise um, anything related to arrogance. Uh, yeah. Next question from Bill. What would I say to those responsible for sending me to war? So what would you say to those responsible for sending you to war? Um, I don't think it would be anything like venomous. You know, I don't, I think it's not, it's no secret that I think that we went into some places and were sent on some operations and there's different strategies and campaign, campaigns that went ahead that were based on false premise and sold to the Joe, Joe public as, you know, as being one thing which was untrue. The actual intent was an alternative reason, but I don't think I'd say anything venomous to the people who sent me. So I mean, let's let's take prime ministers, for example. You know, Tony Blair sent me into Iraq, uh, the Iraq war in 2003, then again in 2005. Um, oh, hang on. When was Tony? Who was after Tony Blair? And then whoever whoever was the next prime minister sent was it? Oh, David, I can't remember. Tory, I think, sent me into Afghanistan three times. Uh, you know, before that, it was being sent into Northern Ireland. Uh, I think I'd, I suppose of saying something like venomously. I'd rather have a conversation with them. So kind of similar to the reason I mentioned about having a conversation with, you know, the the, the dream guests on the podcast. Some of those people are negative people. Like, I shudder to think, well, I can imagine some people shudder at the thought of me saying, you know, Donald Trump. But there's a reason. The reason is for the same, kind of the same answer to this. It's like, I'd like to have a conversation with, you know, Tony Blair. What the fuck was the other guy's name? The Tory. No, oh, I can't remember. Um, and Trump. And, and in order to... So the whites of their eyes and work out if these people understand or if these people acted dishonestly or not. See, one of the things with I always I always try and maybe too much try and play devil, devil's advocate with things. One of the things I think about with premiers, presidents, prime ministers making decisions on it's like major decisions like you know like Ukraine, Iraq, uh, not so much North Ireland, but Ukraine, Iraq, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Oh God, Q8, Libya, the list goes on, is they make decisions based on, one, based on what they believe is the right thing to do, and that is largely based on the information they're being provided um, and how, they, how they're perceiving that information how they're, um, and how they're uh, interpreting that information. And that's done by their advisors around them. So I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, it's never a prime minister's fault if a bad decision is made to go and do something. I'm saying there is an element of it, right, is if you've got a bad team around you, bad actors around you, then it's going to be difficult to make the right decisions, especially if you don't realise you've got arseholes around you. So I would would like to 
I like with Blair, for example, I'd love to sit down with him. I say I'd love to. It would be good to sit down with him and him, just in private, have a conversation and try and, and just to get an understanding of, well, I think he's a lying bastard who sent us in a false, false premise and knew that there was no weapons of mass destruction at the time and knew there was an ulterior motive to invade in Iraq. Or he really did believe that. <clears throat> so that's what I do. Um, excuse me. I'm sniffing because I got uh, I got head butted playing squash yesterday with my uh, with my fiance, and it gave me a bloody nose and it's messed my messed my messed my sinuses up. Okay, next question: How fair is unit life in Power Reg? Is bullying stroke bad treatment a problem? Um, I say bullying and bad treatment is it's probably I I. I think it's likely to be less of a problem than it is in other units. And the reason I say that is because the the so the units I serve with the power well, the units I serve with, the subunits and three power I serve with, generally from what I saw about the units is the the standard of dis- discipline was a lot higher. Now you can counter that argument with some of the high profile stuff that's been in the news over the last few years to do with <laughs> particularly three power. They've just been I'd fucking dramas two or three times, but but um, I do think the standard of discipline is a little bit higher <clears throat> compared to other units. Now I'm based on I'm basing that on anecdotal evidence. You know, uh, I haven't got a bunch of stats and figures and surveys and assessments here to, to base that on. So I, you know, I, I could well be wrong, but it's also a, a hard fact is that a hard, fact, a hard and fast fact is that the standard of the standard of um, soldiers in in units which have a selection is generally higher, in, and the standards of the leaders and the commanders and the, uh, and the people in management positions is generally higher because it's a selection process. That's why the selection process to to set a higher standard, to have a star, higher standard of whatever in whatever organisation. Um, and with that comes a higher, especially in the military. With that comes uh, a higher uh, value placed on unit cohesion, morale, uh, camaraderie, um, all of those things that make a fighting unit or any uh, group of people with a common aim, a common intent, good at what they do. And so if a unit allows, and it does happen occasionally, right, with units, if a unit does allow um, a lot of, bullying bad treatment of uh whichever rank or whichever whichever sub subgroup within a, a unit it is not good for the unit and it gets certainly in power edge got it gets stamped out very quickly if the right leaders and the right the right people are in place to recognize it and act on it that doesn't mean it doesn't happen i've definitely experienced um experienced and seen uh bullying behavior during my time in three para, for sure, definitely did. Uh, there's even some things I've been involved with way back when, which, looking back, could be perceived as bullying. Now, if you look at it now, looking back, could be perceived as bullying at the time, which I don't think the people involved would have realised that, but could well be. So it does exist, but I, I think in general, uh, it, it, it's not a problem, and it gets quashed pretty quickly, pretty quickly, uh, especially. Especially nowadays, uh, probably over the last five, ten years, I think, where there is a, a, a big focus on mental health, mental health in the unit, uh, and bullying and bad treatment of people is not good for mental health, right? And it also can be an indication of poor mental health for the people enacting it, the protagonists, you know? Uh, the, f- the first part of the question was, is how fair is unit life in Power Edge? Now, in general, I always knew what was expected of me and where I stood in ter- within a unit. So I don't mean where I stood in, like, in terms of the hierarchy or like the social status or whatever. I mean whether I was doing the wrong thing or doing the right thing. But it was very clear to me what was the expected behaviour. That changed over time. Again, changes with leaders, changes with management, changes with unit, changes with mission, changes with operational environment changes chronologically over time for whatever reason um but i always understood 
<laughs> what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say it's about as fair as you can get if you judge fairness by generally people getting treated equally uh, and given a fair chance to uh, understand and follow the guidelines. Um, um, th these things, I mean, th it's fairest on ops and is minimal bullying and bad treatment on operations because the stakes are higher. So all of those things you value for unit cohesion and unit success and capability, uh, the, the value goes up when you're in operations. It's more likely to happen back in the back back at home um, in the unit, and it's also more likely to happen when operational tempo is really low, like it is now, like it is now. So right now, within the British forces in general, you know, I'd say that the instances of bullying and mistreatment and ship management are increased because oh, a bunch of different reasons. Um, you know, one example is when the operational tempo is lower. You tend to have it tends to be more difficult to to retain individuals, so you lose experience. You, you lose, you know, people who are very capable leaders and managers and soldiers, sailors, airmen, airwomen, um, and you also uh, it's harder to recruit in. So the standards of the standards of recruit coming in is generally lower. You'll 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 definitely find that the uh, the standards that um, recruiting it recruiting the standards of recruits coming in out it does does lower and uh, lower operational tempo because we can't afford to have such high standards i mean you see that in obviously also internally with uh with um you know like sf selection and and uh and, and ps selection other other uh, units which select out when they are finding it harder to recruit people if they're not meeting the quotas they need to meet to maintain their uh manning then sometimes standards get lowered Maybe in a really mild way, but it, it for sure happens. Um, yeah. Okay, next question. Did senior military officers have a good or bad impact on your tours? Uh, on tours. My experience of bad senior officers... Senior, yeah, senior officers on tours. <sighs> I saw one get replaced once uh, while we were we were out. I won't give the operation of the year, but we were out, and uh, he was relatively new to the unit. He was, uh, I mean, he was an officer. He wasn't relatively senior, but he it was became very apparent that um, he wasn't as capable as he should be and he got he got replaced which is that i mean that doesn't happen very often uh but uh, he got replaced pretty quick just a shame um i don't think you know i don't think his his actions or his um his leadership caused you know it, it didn't cause anything like you know deaths or serious casualties it just it was just bad morale <laughs> it was just bad for morale uh, yeah, but um, it definitely caused a problem. What's interesting as well is what you perceive to be a good or a bad individual leader officer um, at home, like in the UK, when you're not on operations, your op your opinion of them can change drastically when you experience working with them on operations. And I saw that as well. Uh, I saw that in 2006 in Afghanistan, where there was a there was an officer. And he was, I think it's fair to say, he was despised. He was despised. Um, and then we deployed to Afghan. And when, basically, his his leadership and management of his unit, I don't want to give away the, the unit or the size of anything, because it, it, it may be easy to identify him. But... The, the people's opinion of him as a leader changed. It, it flicked from asshole. We think he's an asshole. Get rid of him. To this guy's amazing, and it was and it was like that. You know, he and that is basically because he he, he came he became a different person when it was a real combat operations. Um, 
he, essentially he wasn't suited to life back in the UK. You know, like barrack, barrack life leading that way, and it's a mundane. It's a shitty. It's a shitty existence. It is not like not. It's not nice for most people being in the military when you're based when you're at home, uh, depending on which unit you're in. You know, you're just constantly. You're constantly training, which is fine, but the tempo can be really high and it can get really mundane. And if you get the wrong people in the wrong place, it can just be an absolute misery. He was one of those people. And then op on operations in Afghanistan, uh, he became, he, wasn't, he didn't become, it was apparent that he was a gifted individual in, in those circumstances. And his, his men were very grateful um, for uh, having that leader. And I think they were probably as surprised as anyone else to realise that, actually. He's a, he's a decent guy. <laughs> glad, glad we still got him. Uh, yeah. Um, there are one... There is one more, I think. How would I feel... So here it is, last one. How would I feel if my kids wanted to follow my same path? So same unit, same role, same length of service, same amount of action, in inverted commas, on chores, same age on joining, etc. How would it, well, if they really wanted to do it, I would not stop them. No way, I would not stop them. So the way I like, I don't, I don't encourage them to join right now, and it's that's only because I don't want to put pressure on them, feeling like they should follow in my shoes, which would be surprising because uh, they're girls. I've got two girls, I haven't got boys. Uh, I don't want to pressure them into doing something they may not want to do, or you know. Uh, um, but if they wanted to, I'd have no problem. If one if one of them wanted to join, one of both of them wanted to join up, and they were they were intent on joining up, and they wanted to join an infantry unit, which in itself would be surprising because they're girls, and it'd be yeah, I would encourage them to join Power Edge, for this, and this is for a selfish fact. <laughs> Because I would want them, I would want them to be whichever one of them did it. I would want them to be the first, the first female to get through parachute regiment training, then pass P Company as a recruit, not as all arms, and someone who's already served, been through their own training. Different. I want them to do parachute regiment training, get through that, be selected to get on to go on to P Company, get selected on P Company past P company and then get into a unit as a woman who has been through the full power reg process. So there are, the reason I point that out is because there, there are two women who have, I think it's two now have passed, they've passed all arms P company. And that is, that is in itself, that is an incredible achievement. Uh, what has not been done is a female doing parachute regiment training all the way through that. And then, and then, and then get the P company. Cause that is, a, it's a very, very different beast to uh, simply, um, applying to get onto All Arms P Company um, as an already a trained soldier in whatever unit, and then passing it. Again, I'm not taking it away from the two ladies who have who have passed P Company now, but it is a different beast. When a female goes through parachute regiment training for the first time, gets through that, legitimately gets through that, then gets on P Company, passes that, and gets into battalion as the first female paratrooper. That that will be a fucking game changer. Pardon my language. That will be a game changer. And that's not been seen yet. And I don't think it's going to be seen for a while. Because the training is miserable. <laughs> and it's very, 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 very difficult. Very, very difficult. Very difficult indeed. Just to get to the point of being able to get on P Company. It's very difficult. So um, I'd be fine with it if they really wanted to do it. Yeah, I would. Uh... Yeah, that's it. That's all the questions. And sorry I did this in two parts, but I think people listening, you won't realise, but people watching, and I've changed clothes and polo shirt and all that. Not polo shirt, baseball cap and stuff. It's fine. But no, cheers for the questions. Uh, look forward to number 199, which is Geraint Jones discussing uh, his... Well, we discussed the Afghan withdrawal at length. You are going to enjoy that podcast. You are going to enjoy that podcast. I certainly enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was a really good valuable discussion on that situation and what happened and is you, you can have some eye openers in that as well uh, in terms of what Gez and Lev discovered when they were doing their research and interviews for the book um, 
and then number 200 is uh, going to be a drunk cast with uh, three three good friends of mine. Um, we did episode 100 together, and episode 200 is going to be another drunk cast. Basically, on the on the, on the anniversary podcast, like 100s, 200s, and 300. When I get there, I'm just gonna. They are just a jolly for me. I want to get people in. We're going to get drunk, shoot the shit, and and I, and, and have fun. Uh, Number 201 is Janie McGill. Janie McGill's coming on to talk about uh, what she's been up to the last few years since she last came on and uh, the impending film that she has got being released. And episode 202 is with Roger Theron. Roger Theron is a South African. Uh, he's a South African guy, he served in the military, and he now uh, works uh, in the agricultural industry and was put into a role by horses farming again you'll enjoy that one uh we discuss all all kinds of interesting topics yeah cool cheers for listening um if you're enjoying the podcast become a patron if you want to support the podcast share this episode share all of the episodes if you can but also become a patron of the podcast uh you get access to all of the interviews for free uh, for free you get access to all you get access to all of the interviews um earlier than anyone else you get access to private interviews with every guest called icebreakers which are uh, uh, 10 to 15 minute interviews that are secret these are done with every guest and they're released only to patrons um so for example you know we've got uh Geraint jones coming on the podcast will go out but he will also have done an icebreaker which has gone privately to patrons that the public won't hear you can if you're a patron uh there's often free giveaways gift giveaways we do a, every month we do a uh, we do a zoom call together all the patrons get on a zoom call with me we shoot the shit and occasionally we have a previous guest come on and do a private q a with uh, with the patrons so um yeah if you fancy supporting the podcast if you're enjoying it like i do this i do this in a, i have a day job like, i do this on top of that it is not easy to do right it takes up a lot of my time to fit in around the podcast so it is and there's a lot of work goes on behind the scenes for every hour you yeah, for every hour of recording i do on the podcast it's probably i don't know maybe three yeah about three hours on top of that that goes into actually producing the podcast and put it out and again it and, and getting it into your ears onto your eyes so um i appreciate all existing patrons i appreciate all existing sponsors as well rugby for heroes and the aardvark group and uh I welcome more. So go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts or just go to the web the, the podcast website and the links are on there and become a patron. Um, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Keep enjoying the rest and look forward to episode 199. Out.